the, the, the covenant through Jesus, the whole goal is repentance, change the way you think, and the forgiveness of sins. If there's a forgiveness of sins, there shouldn't be a consciousness of sin. There should be a death to it. The biggest mistake we make in the body of Christ is we think our ability to sin identifies us as sinners. Yeah. And then when we're identified as sinners, we make the tree sinner. And guess what the fruit has to be? Sin. Yeah. God. Look at this. If the worshipers, if this thing was sufficient, they would have stopped offering year by year because the worshipers would have been pure and clean in the sight of God and they'd have been free from the consciousness of sin. That is the goal of Christianity in your conscience to get you free from sin so you can live as a son so you can become love and manifest his great name. Did you get it? You are not in a war against sin. That's what he won. Your fight is the good fight of faith to continue to walk in what he accomplished and believe it's true no matter how you feel. Your war is not against sin. That's the one he won. You're not fighting sin. You're fighting the good fight of faith. Faith is you walking out what you became through him, what he accomplished through the cross. So your fight is the good fight of faith. Colossians 2 says, as you've received him, so walk in him. How'd you receive him? By faith. One day your heart moved and you just believed he was right. And you just believed your life needed change. And you just believed that it was time to die so you could live it. And you gave yourself to him by faith. And it says, as you've received him, so walk in him. Rooted and established in the faith. It said, be careful, lest any man cheat you, plunder you, hold you captive through empty deceit, through traditions of the world, through the basic principles of life, philosophy, the basic principles of life, the traditions of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Don't let anybody cheat you. You've arrived in Christ. And you're complete in Him. And if you camp there and live there and start where He finished, you will run well. If you try to fulfill what He already did, you're going to feel like you're failing. You're going to try to fight a battle He already won. And you're out of bounds. You're living in an arena you're not even called. You have to start where He finished. Colossians 1 says, you and I were alienated and enemies to God by the way our wicked minds work. That means self-centered, just all about us thinking. Our minds were twisted from love. Love became selfish. Your created value got twisted and we were born into Adam and every man was conscious of himself. Every man was conscious of his flesh. Every man was living for reputation, acceptance, esteem, affirmation. Every man was in desperate search for the lost identity of his created value. So we all looked for love in all the wrong places because we didn't know we were made to be love, not need love. And that's why all the hurt and the pain, the discouragement and the eye for eye and the rightness and all the jealousy and all the pride and all the contention, all the backstabbing, that's why all things have happened on the earth because every man's for himself. A big thing happened when he ate that tree. He stepped out of what he was created for and all of that died and he became a God unto himself. If we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, guess what we have? We have a born again experience, man. We're going to have fellowship with one another. We're not going to hide. We're not wearing a veil. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from. So what did you just get through the blood in that verse? You just got what? Cleansed from what? How much? If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves and make God a liar. That's the one that preachers pull out one line it. What's it saying? If you say you have no need for the blood.
When you're preaching on free from sin, people are saying, yeah, but we're always going to sin, but we always got sin. That's blasphemy. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, what they're saying is you're sinning while you're breathing and you're always guilty of sin all the time. Well, if that was true, you could never be righteous. You could never approach him and he could never live inside of you. Did you get it? I hope you're getting this. I know I've been talking a lot, but get this last part. Because if we say we have no sin, what you're saying is if you have no need for the blood. You deceive yourself and you make him a liar. Watch. But if we recognize our need for the blood and confess our sins, guess what he's faithful to do? Forgive us and cleanse us from how much? So in three verses, you've been cleansed of all sin and cleansed of all unrighteousness. And you're going to pull the middle verse out and say, yeah, but brother, if we say we have no sin, we're deceived and we're, we're making God a liar because every man's a sinner. He just said you're cleansed of it all and washed of it all. Now watch, now watch. He clarifies it. If we say we have not sinned, that means we had no need for the blood. That's what he meant the first time when he said, if we say we have no sin. He's saying, if we say we have not sin. Hey, I don't know what you're talking about, repentance. I'm a pretty good guy, man. I don't, I don't hurt nobody, man. I make pies for the neighbor. I rake their leaves. I'm a good kid. If we say we have not sinned, guess what we do? We make him a liar and his word is not in us. That means if you say you have no need for a savior... Chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so you may not sin. He's not saying, but you know you're always gone, and if you say you're not, you're twisted and deceived. He's preaching righteousness. He's preaching cleansed. He's preaching washed in the blood. He's preaching white as snow. He's saying have fellowship with one another because you're walking in him and you're walking in the light as he's in the light, man. He's brought you to the truth. Your conscience is clear. You can now have communion with each other because you have communion with him and the blood of Jesus makes you stand clean in his sight all the time, every day. He says, I'm writing this to you so you may not sin. He doesn't say, but when you do. He says, but if you do. He is not opening the door for you to fail. He is closing that door and saying, keep living in righteousness and see how far it will take you. And if anyone sins... Just know you have an advocate and he's before the Father pleading your case and you'll receive mercy. He is not saying, well, go ahead and sin. God will love you anyway. He's saying you are called to righteousness. You're called to walk in the light and he's in the light. And he paid the price for this thing and made you squeaky clean. Now enjoy that life and don't look back. But if you do, know the day's not over and life's not ruined. You have one speaking on your behalf. So let that put more integrity. Keep on running and be washed even more. You get it? Come on, that's the gospel. It's scripture after scripture that teaches this stuff. Look, any man that understands the beauty of what I'm preaching and hears it clear is empowered to live in the sight of God and stay clean. I haven't found a way. I'm saying this for the sixth or fifth or sixth time. I haven't found a way to sin and get away with it. I have found a way to be free. He has broken every chain. God has cursed sin in the flesh. And sin shall have no dominion over me. I am not under the law. I'm under grace. Shall I sin because I'm not under the law and under grace? Of course not. How shall we who died to it keep living in it? I'm a son, not sin. It's all through your Bible. You guys get it? So this was what I'm going to leave you with. I want every person to be encouraged to approach God like you've never approached God. You come to Him often and always. Don't make appointments with God. Don't give Him an hour a day. Don't give Him a devotional time in the morning. Yes. Develop a relationship with Him that is just who you are with Him all the time. Learn to commune with Him. Become conscious of Him. Talk to Him often. Thank Him a lot. Drive in your car and just find yourself, thanks for loving me. Thanks for fathering me. 
Thanks for transforming my life. Stop waiting to feel transformed and start thanking Him for transforming your life. Stop waiting for to feel His love and start thanking Him He loves you through Jesus Christ. Stop waiting for the feeling of deliverance and lift your hands and say, You have delivered me. You have a right to approach Him and rejoice in what He's accomplished. You have a right to put off the old in prayer and put on the new in prayer. And let me give you a little idea what that looks like because you're saved by grace through faith. So if you don't release faith in these truths, you won't receive grace in these truths. But if you release faith in these truths, grace will come to make your faith your reality in life. The, everything about the kingdom of God is held together by this one thing, that God sees you as if you've never sinned. So if God sees you as if you've never sinned, why would you ever see yourself for what you've done wrong? How about starting where he finished and run well? How about putting on righteousness and bearing your fruit unto holiness? You're not a person trying to get it right. You've been made right. And now the Spirit of God is upon you and you begin to walk this thing out that's come alive in your heart. Yeah. See, the kingdom of God's not meat or drink. It's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. When you have right standing with God, you have peace with God. When you have peace with God, you have amazing joy. It's good tidings of great joy. We're not trying to be happy people. <laughs> the gospel is here. God loves us, made us in his image and redeemed what he created us to be. And there's no stopping us now unless we fail to see and receive. I don't know if you realize this or not, but sitting in your chair right now through the blood of Jesus, God sees you as if you've never eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Behold the Lamb of God who... What's he do? Okay, so he took it away. So now what? Guess we ought to be sons and daughters. <laughs> Probably ought to just say, yay. <laughs> what did he do? Took it away. Here's the biggest mistake we make. We think that our ability to sin and our ability to miss the mark is who we are. We are what he finished and what he accomplished. And he says we're righteous. And that song we sang is so true. I am all that he says I am. And if he says it, he's right because he's God. Why did he breathe on them? Because he took them back to the beginning. Watch this. As if sin never happened. So you find in 1 Peter 2 that you're dead to sin. In 1 Peter 6, three times that you're freed from sin. And you also find in Hebrews 10 that you have no more consciousness of sin. And then you see in he, uh, Romans 6, 11, the death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives for God. Likewise, you reckon yourself dead indeed to sin and alive unto God in Christ Jesus. It's the power of righteousness, it's the power of His blood, and it's the call of the gospel that you wake up every day with a clear conscience and an unveiled face ready to pursue His image and to manifest His love. It's your privilege what you do with I Preach. It's you're the steward of your heart. You can let life speak louder than truth if you want. You can say, I don't want that, or you can enter in. But this is your created value, and this is where grace is, and this is what we're called to. And this is what will change the entire world and cover the earth with his glory. It's not a mystical revival we're believing for. It's God raising up the truth of who we are in his people till his glory covers the earth. You, um, you said we don't have a dual nature. We don't, not even like with the flesh and the spirit. There's a, there's a, there's a, that's what we're going to get into fasting, and I'll explain it real clear. In other words, I don't want anybody to believe you have died. The old man, the old man is what? Crucified. The new man is what? 
put on. He's come. You've raised in the likeness of the resurrection of Christ. It says if you died in the likeness of his death and died to sin once for all, surely we raise in the newness of life. What a lot of people believe is I'm sin waiting to happen. And that sin is inherent in me, it's buried in me, and it's waiting to raise its ugly head. And as soon as you accept that, you give to the power of sin. Remember how Romans 6? Don't present your members to unrighteousness as if you're bound to serve it. You're not a slave to sin. It says who you give your members to, that you become a slave to serve. Do you follow what I'm saying? Don't you be afraid to declare that you live by the Spirit, that you're righteous in the sight of God, that righteousness is burning in your heart, and the will to live like God, and to walk like God, and to love like God has been imputed and imparted through Christ Jesus, and you are born again. To be born again, something's dead. (laughs) Something has to die so something can... Live. I am not sin waiting to happen. That's one of the bigger, big mistakes we make as well in the church. The way we think because we have the ability to sin, it's our identity. What crushes and silences your ability to sin is giving and yielding yourself as members unto righteousness for its fruit unto holiness. Remember Romans 6 last week or early this week or whenever it was? How many times did he say, we're freed from sin? It doesn't mean I can't commit an act of sin if I yield myself to that. But can I yield myself continually to God and keep giving myself to God and actually grow in a stronghold of righteousness to where the things that used to drive me and eat my lunch and be a given in the way of the flesh are no longer and what was weak is now strong. What she says, he says, watch and pray. Because the spirit is willing and the flesh is. So then we say, see, brother, Jesus knows the flesh is weak. Listen to what he said. Watch and pray. Because the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. What's he saying? If you watch and pray, you're going to live by the spirit. You're going to live out of the strength of the spirit. You're going to crush the weakness of the flesh. But if you don't watch and pray and you just let the same old, same old way that seems right, man, you're just going to have the same old experience, same old manifestations. Here we go again. And then we're reduced to writing songs. We wonder why you would love us this way. Because we identify ourselves for the fall instead of the resurrection. We identify ourselves for the image of sin instead of the image of God. Let us make man in our image. And in the likeness of God, he made man. So that's how he made man. That's man's created value. So Christ is the redemption of man. He brings us back to that root value. And he has washed away sin. Yeah, brother, but we all sin. What are you saying? You're perfect? That question comes up constantly. And that mindset is what keeps men bound in the flesh. I don't even know why that's our initial question. Why don't we rejoice at the hearing of righteousness instead of affirm and qualify sin? Can I tell you why? Because most of the time when that question is asked, people are living in the consciousness of it and it's in them. And, and, And when they hear this message, there's this vibration and there's this, well, what are you saying? You're perfect? What, you don't miss it? So what, you don't sin? That's not the question. The Bible says, if I sin. It doesn't say when. I don't have an appointment with it. It's not like I don't sin while I'm breathing. It says, if I sin, no, I have an advocate and everything's covered. Why? Because the last thing a Christian's supposed to be doing is even thinking about sin. He's supposed to be thinking right with God. So it's not about willful sin. It's not about lasciviousness. It's not about me just, you know, hypocrisy. It's, I, I want Jesus. I want His fullness. I want to manifest Him. Man, I'm in this thing. I'm on the trains, uh, on the track of God's, you know, righteousness and holiness. I'm a train going down the track, man. I ain't slowing. I ain't. If along that way I sin, man, just know you have an advocate. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Keep trucking. Let me love you and make you what I've called you to be. But don't you stop running. 
That's what the Bible's saying. Uh, no, I don't have this sin thing inside me. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. I'm telling you, you get to the place where you can't even relate to how you used to think and feel and why did I even think that was so awesome when I see it now for what it is and it's so not it's called transformation if I can see things for what they really are oh that's what the gospel's all about bringing light and shining light in the darkness so I can see things for the way they really are <laughs> I look so good to him, it's ridiculous. Come on. He made me beautiful. Come on. He took away everything that was flesh and sin and self-centered and deceived. He took everything that was Adam after the tree and he took it away. And he put me before the tree and clothed me with Christ. That's where a lot of people are. A lot of people just trying to live the Christian life because it's the right thing to do. And yet there's no real revelation of their value or God's love for them or how free they are from the old and the former and, 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 and of sin itself. We're almost afraid to speak that. We think we have to hold up our ability to sin high or something and that's humility. That's not humility. That's deception. I'm not supposed to hold up my ability to sin high. I'm supposed to hold up high His ability to love me and forgive me and through the blood make me clean. That's what I'm holding high. I've been made right through the blood of Jesus Christ once for all He died for me. Do you get it? Come on, I'm reconciled. God sees me blameless, holy, and above reproach. It's that goodness that I have to receive that turns my heart to change. Do you get it? Or I'm going to live from a place of struggle and I'm still going to try to be a better person. I can promise you this. In the 16 years I've been saved, last week, June 9th, we didn't even realize it until we were up here. It was my spiritual birthday last week, June 9th. I'm glad or you guys might have did something weird and sang or something. I don't know. But, but, but 16, 16 years ago, on, on June 9th, I, I was born again. And I can honestly tell you this. I don't have one memory, thought, or day or recollection of trying to live right. Not one thought. That's not even in my mind. I'm not trying to live right. <laughs> I'm in fellowship with God. I'm in love. I'm in love. And the manifestation of that relationship causes my life to be a certain way. It's, I think a certain way. I act a certain way. I do a certain way. It all comes out. It's all fueled by this. So I'm not waking up trying to be a Christian. I don't even know what that means. That's impersonal, trying to be a Christian. No, you're enjoying being a son, a daughter. You're enjoying being one with Him. You're enjoying being loved by God in the midst of all your weakness of the past days. He has come and given you strength and life and an identity and a purpose. Come on, that's the Christian life. That's relationship with God. We, we are so caught up with trying to do the right thing and live the right way. That just flows out of knowing Him. It's the spot. Colossians says you were, you were alienated and enemies to God by the wicked works in your mind. Yet He has reconciled through His death your life, right? To present you through His death holy, blameless, and above reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith and are not moved away from the hope. That you heard. In other words, you don't let anything talk you out of it. Holy, blameless, above reproach. That's how powerful the blood is. One minute, you're wicked and alienated from God by the way you think. And now the blood has washed over you and showed you your need for a Savior. And has done a clean sweep and washed away everything you've ever done. To present you holy, blameless, and above reproach if you don't let anything talk you out of it. Do you realize your sins are forgiven? realize if you're sincere in your born again experience that your sins are forgiven that there's remission of sins not reminder of sins remission Hebrews 10 says that through one sacrifice he perfected forever 
<laughs> you're perfected. Holy and blameless and above reproach. You're righteous in the sight of God. The Bible says, reckon yourself dead to sin, alive to God. We're not fighting with sin. He already conquered it. God cursed sin in the flesh. Sin shall have no dominion over you. The law of the spirit of life through Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. I live through him. I'm alive. Sin is gone. I've been freed from sin. I could show you that phrase over and over and over in the Bible. And yet we preach the gospel and keep a sin consciousness intact. And we're trying to live better lives. Are you kidding me? We're learning to be sons. We're already perfected. We're not waking up trying to live the Christian life. We're waking up being sons, redeemed, forgiven. Thank you, Father. What a good day to be alive. The blood of Jesus is on the mercy seat speaking on my behalf. And all you see is my value, my potential, and my destiny. And because your grace is in my life, surely it shall be fulfilled. Because I believe your gospel. Not what people say. Not what I feel and think sometimes. Not what I hear in my head at times. But from my heart, I know your word is true. And I'm right in your sight. And it's amazing to be alive in you. That ought to be our prayer lives. For by one sacrifice, one offering, He has perfected forever those who are set apart. You're already perfected. You're already perfected in His presence forever. All He can see is the best about you and the potential through Christ. And as you yield to that, grace comes and meets that and manifests the evidence. The just shall live by faith. He takes away the first name, establishes the second. By this will we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Oh God. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Wow. Come on, it's in your Bible. Sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting to his enemies were made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are set apart. <gasps> you got to start where he finished. We used to be ruled by sin, but the gospel forgives us of sin, and all of a sudden the stronghold and power of it is destroyed, and it stops the consciousness of sin. I could show you in Hebrews where the first covenant was bulls and goats in every day, and if it was powerful enough to, to take away sin, they'd have had no more consciousness of sin, but in no way it said, did it make the worshipers perfected before God. And then it talks about Jesus coming to do God's will, and it says in saying that He came to do a will, He takes away the first to bring forth the second. Hebrews 10. And then it talks about Him through one sacrifice for sins, perfecting forever. You're perfected forever. Who, me? Yep, because He judges you in righteousness. You're perfected forever. Sin is moved away so He can get to the real you and begin to work from there in a sanctifying power. It says you are perfected through one sacrifice. Those who are being sanctified are perfected. Well, that's blasphemy. No, it's Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> You're perfected forever. You've got to live from that place. I'm, I'm not on eggshells. I'm in the Christ. Now you can tell by my passion that doesn't give me a looseness to live. It gives me a sincerity of heart. It builds integrity in me. It builds honor in me towards God. The last thing I want to do is even think of missing God. But that's not the stronghold of my life. The stronghold of my life is the fact that He loves me and I'm His son. But in my heart, the last thing I want to do is miss God. So if I stumble along the way... I told you, we just confess it. He cleans me up. I'm sharper, wiser, smarter, and more in love than I was before I missed it. My, verse 7 of Romans 6. For he who has died is what? Free. What is he? Free. Freed from sin. Yeah. 
<laughs> so you are not still a sinner. If you've died, you're free from sin. That doesn't mean you don't have the ability to miss the mark at times. That doesn't mean, but see, I don't talk about that much. You don't hear me because I'm not given permission for the flesh. And I don't want you even thinking, well, what, are we perfect? When don't we ever going to sin? You are freed from sin. So he doesn't even want you asking that question. Just take on righteousness. Enjoy being righteous. Be a son and live for God. Don't think about sin. Don't think about the devil. Be a son and you'll be amazed what that looks like. It's not about trying not to sin ever again in your life. You're freed from sin. Who just saw you're freed from sin? So our war is not trying not to sin. Our war is actually embracing and staying with an unveiled face, looking in the mirror, realizing we're sons, we're sons, we're daughters, we're daughters, we're, we're the children of God. That becomes your biggest battle. Just you're lovable. God is for you. He made you. You're the elect. You're his purpose. All that good stuff. Because life tries to steal that away and convince you otherwise. The devil is so afraid that you'll see this. Yes. <laughs> He's trying to tell you why it can't be true. And unfortunately, sometimes you can have 10, 10, 10 good, strong truths in front of you and one little whisper and you grab the whisper. Yeah. So you're not failure waiting to happen. Your son's in the making. <laughs> You're not sin in the next moment. You're saints rising up. Amen. Yes. He didn't write to the sinners of Ephesus. He wrote to the saints. He didn't say to those about to miss at any moment in Colossae. He didn't say to you Philippians, they're going to need to call on the blood any moment now. I write to you. He wrote to the saints. He sees you that way. Because he knows what he made when he made man. And he didn't curse it, he blessed it. Read your Bible. And love never fails. We've taught this false humility. Well, why would he love me? Because he created me in his image. Yes. Come on. Yeah, but you're just a person and you're just a sinner. No, he didn't write to the sinners of Ephesus, the sinners of Philippi, the sinners of Colossae. He wrote to the saints. The blood is enough to make you clean if you believe it. You're not supposed to be sin conscious. And don't you let nobody sell you cheap. Because when they tell you, well, you're just a sinner, then you'll define your tree a wrong way and you'll produce fruit according to what you believe about you. I'm not sin waiting to happen. I'm a son manifesting. It's so scriptural. He didn't write to the sinners of Ephesus. He wrote to the saints. He didn't write to those about to miss it in Colossae. He wrote to the saints. He didn't write to those who will be very glad for the blood in a minute in Philippi. He wasn't setting them up to fail. He was telling them, you're in, you're clean, your names are in the book, your family, you're God's choice. What he's doing is he's making a tree good. And you can't afford to, yeah, but, yeah, but. That's unbelief. While you were yet a sinner, he came. Christ died for the ungodly. I get the ungodly. We all needed the blood. We all sinned and fell short. The mountains are low. The valleys are up. We're all on the same plane. We need the blood of Jesus. Come on, that's not a surprise to any of us. It's, let's quit boasting in our ability to fail and calling it humility. And let's keep thinking, let's, why do we keep thinking? Let's stop keeping on thinking that our ability to sin makes us sinners. Or you're empowering it. Oh, and you got the tape running. <laughs> Wonder if we have yet to see. What the work of grace looks like in a person's life that believes the gospel. Wonder if we've preached our own experiences and one another's experiences. Wonder if we've really failed to follow Christ. What's a man look like with the full measure of grace that was made available through the purchase, possession, and purpose of Christ? What, what does a man look like that's wearing the full measure of grace through the cross? I bet he looks a lot like Jesus. 
trouble is, if that happens, we make them an enigma. We put them on a pedestal. We bring them to the world conference. We make them the guest speakers. And we think they're gifted instead of just believers. And then somehow we see them different than us and think their results can't be ours. Okay, for the equipping of the saints, not sinners, the equipping of the saints, not sinners. That's awesome. For the work of the ministry. So it's possible to be a saint in the sight of the Lord, huh? Man, you look up the word saint once. Jesus of faith would say, that's what the blood did for me. I'm going to walk in the honor of that. That's a joy. Just accept it and say yay. (laughs) Truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, guess what we have? We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from how much sin? All. All sin. He's telling you you've become righteous. You're in the light as He's in the light. You're seen as a son as He's seen in a son. Two have become one. You're right in the sight of Father. Watch. So watch this. For then would they have not ceased, if the the worshipers would have been perfect, would they have not ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. So the goal of the Gospel is to get you to have no more consciousness of sin. It's right in your Bible. It says if the way they were doing it was the way it was, then it would have worked and nobody would have had a consciousness of sin and they'd have been perfected forever. But those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sin every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Why? The fact that they had to do it every year just reminded them that they've messed up, they've messed up, they've messed up, they've messed up. So they're always living under the ability to sin, the consciousness of sin, and unfortunately we carry that into the gospel today. And it's not humble, it's actually deception. But if you ever read Hebrews 10 and do yourself a big favor, it talks about the old covenant and the priest going daily, and that there wasn't a sufficient sacrifice. If it was, they'd have ceased to be offered. And it said that they weren't sufficient because if they were, there would have been no more consciousness of sin. Which means the gospel is to erase the consciousness of sin. We don't preach sin, we preach righteousness. Righteousness is the power of God unto salvation. He rules His kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. The kingdom of God isn't meat or drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in Holy Spirit. He didn't die and shed His blood, so I remain a conscious sinner waiting to go to heaven by His mercy. He died to get the identity of sin off of me so I could wear sonship and walk in holiness. Come on, it's all through your Bible. But, but nobody ever taught me that. They just said, pray this prayer because you've been a bad boy. And then we have order call after order call like this. Some of you aren't living for God. Some of you have things in your life. You know how we are. Come on, don't lie. You know our tendencies. You know the things we do in secret. And we talk as if it's normal and common and that everybody has to constantly fail and we're damned and doomed by sin now that He's died to pay the price for it. And week after week, we crawl to the other more order and cry. It's not repentance. It's not change. It's just more consciousness of sin. When are we ever free from sin? When are we ever free from its power? This gospel makes so much provision for freedom. It says, even if I do sin, last thing I'm thinking is sin, guys. Get it out of your mind. It's out of mine. I'm asking you, get it out of yours. Get it out of your heart. Get it out of your mind. Stop thinking about the sin and the devil. They're the two things that stumble us all the time. Why are we thinking of sin and making much of sin and much of the devil? Make much of Jesus. Make much of the cross. Make much of forgiveness. Make much of mercy. Make much of redemption and the love of Papa and Holy Spirit on the inside. Because if you're righteous, conscious, you'll bear fruit to holiness. You're not waking up trying to be a Christian. You're a son. You're a daughter. Possessed and consumed by God. Bought through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're not trying not to sin. You're learning to be a son. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, he shed his blood. He was beat beyond description. The Bible says he was marred more than any of the son, marred more than any of the sons of men. That means when they were done beating Jesus, he looked worse than any man has ever left man look. When they were done beating Jesus, you couldn't possibly tell who he was. There's no way. 
Why? Why was it so sadistic? Why did it have to be so brutal? Why did they have to beat him again and again and again? Why couldn't they just give him the 40 minus 1 and legally, spiritually cover it? Why did they keep beating him with them rods and whacking him across the head? And why did they disfigure him? Because when sin got done with man in the garden, he didn't look anything like he was created to be. So Jesus came and lost his appearance and became what we were disfigured so that we could have the right to get our appearance back and have our identity restored. Now you talk about love. Yeah. <laughs> That to me is, that's love at its finest. I know who they really are. I'll come and take what's necessary upon me to pay the price for that thing to get off of them. I'll become what they are so they can become what I am. A son. Can you imagine Jesus carrying the cross up to the hill? And he's beaten beyond description. Do you understand that you can't even identify him anymore? Do you understand that when you look at him outwardly, you can't even tell it's Jesus? Do you realize the Bible teaches that? That he was marred more than any of the sons of men? That means his physical visage and appearance was battered to the point of not being able to describe him. And yet he's still preaching, he's still talking, he's still alive. That's amazing. Why did he have to get beaten so bad? Well, we know he died so we can live. He was beaten so we can be unbeatable. We know that he went into hell so we never have to. There's a lot of parallels with the gospel. <laughs> but he was beaten beyond description and lost his appearance because when sin got done with us, we didn't look anything like we were created to be. And the perversity was so extreme that we lost the appearance of God. So God sent His Son in the appearance of a man, so He lost His image and we could get restored back to our original value and back to our image. He became like us so we could become like He is. Because He was marred more than any of the sons of men. That's what your Bible says. Now it's either true or it's not. Men have done barbaric things to men. They have burned them in fire. They have drugged them behind chariots for miles. They have done all kinds of things to men that when they were done, you couldn't tell if they were a man. And Jesus was worse. Why? It was important that it had to be that way. Because God made man in His image. And when man ate the tree, the moment he ate the tree, who he was died. And as soon as sin entered him, he didn't look anything like he was made to be. Man was unrecognizable from the image of God and became completely self-centered and self-serving. So Jesus took that identity upon Himself and became undescribable, unrecognizable, so we could inherit back our identity and get back the image of God. So He became disfigured like we were spiritually, so we could become spiritually made whole. It had to be that extreme. He had to lose His appearance so you could get yours back. Why did he breathe on them? Because he took them back to the beginning. Watch this. As if sin never happened. So you find in 1 Peter 2 that you're dead to sin. In 1 Peter 6, three times that you're freed from sin. And you also find in Hebrews 10 that you have no more consciousness of sin. And then you see in Romans 6, 11, the death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives, he lives for God. Likewise, you reckon yourself dead indeed to sin and alive unto God in Christ Jesus. It's the power of righteousness, it's the power of His blood, and it's the call of the gospel that you wake up every day with a clear conscience and an unveiled face ready to pursue His image and to manifest His love. It's your privilege what you do with I Preach. It's you're the steward of your heart. You can let life speak louder than truth if you want. You can say, I don't want that, or you can enter in. But this is your created value, and this is where grace is, and this is what we're called to. And this is what will change the entire world and cover the earth with His glory. It's not a mystical revival we're believing for. It's God raising up the truth of who we are and His people till His glory covers the earth. You follow me? Amen. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that means if we come clean, come free from ourselves, get in true fellowship with him, come out of the darkness into the light, right? Out of darkness into the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We're born again. We're the body of Christ. We're the people of God. What happens? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from what? All sin. Done. Righteous. I'm not dual natured. I'm not driven by sin, desperately in need of the blood every day. Thank God that's the love of God that He knows my state. I'm always going to sin. Thank God He forgives me. I'm always going to sin. Thank God He forgives me. The lot of the church believes that. It's not true. I'm going to show you why it's not true. The Word tells you it's not true. Watch. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us what? all sin now watch if we say we have no sin you were just cleansed of all sin now he's not telling you to turn around and confess that you always have it if you say you have no sin what's he saying in the context of what he's writing he's saying if you say you have no need for this in your life the cleansing through the blood if he's saying I don't need to be born again I, what do you mean sin? I'm a pretty good fella. I'm already walking the light. I'm not as bad as people are. If you're saying you have no need for a Savior, if you have no need for the blood to cleanse you, if you're saying you have no sin, we're deceived. You're deceived and the truth's not even in you. Do you know there's people trying to be saved by their works? There's people that say, well, I'm a pretty good person. They go to church. There's denominations that have been reduced to trying to be pretty good people and God's going to let me in heaven because I do pretty good. You get it? Now watch. If we confess our sins, I don't believe this is saying, look, we're always going to have sin. If we say we're not, we're deceived and we always have to keep confessing it. It's in light of everything he's writing. What he's saying is, this is my born again experience. Now I can still utilize this and understand that if I'm walking and I stumble and I go, whoa, and the light in my life re reveals that that, was in sin, that wasn't God, that was sin, or my mindset was selfish, and all of a sudden I get convicted that, man, that is so twisted, that is so not... Father, I thank you, that is not who I am and who I'm created to be. God and the light in my life exposed that. I, that is not me. And I have no desire in my life to be willful or selfish and, and touch somebody in a self-righteous place. God, thank you for illuminating me with truth and understanding, forgiving me and washing me of all sin. I thank you that I stay clean in your sight. I am mature and wiser and sharper because you love me and father me. Thanks for truth that's making me free. So in the midst of a misnomer and misconduct in my own motive or mind, I never lose a step in relationship. I actually grow and increase because His goodness keeps me changed. I don't go, oh, I can't believe I was thinking that. Why did I have that motive? And here I am preaching and traveling and saying I'm this and that and I am, not, I am such a hypocrite. Oh my God, I have issues I need healed on the inside. <laughs> forgive me <laughs> no I'm walking out and working out my salvation and above all reverencing God and if I see in my life anything less than him I step over here in a sanctified way and say father that is so not who I am in you you get it and I never sacrifice my identity now watch watch if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to what Forgive us our sins. He's not talking about in the next hour. He's talking about if you recognize your need for a Savior and that you've lived in a selfish, sinful manner driven by sin or selfishness, whatever you want to call it, He is faithful to just cleanse you. You come out of the darkness into the light and you walk in Him as He's in the light because His blood has cleansed you and it introduces you to family and now you have fellowship with one another. He's actually preaching righteousness here. And your born again experience. Watch. Here's how you know. If he's confessed our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So once you're cleansed of all unrighteousness, guess what you forever are? Righteous. 
And if you let your identity be ruled by a sin you commit after you're saved, you're deceived. You'll be condemned in your mind. You won't face God. You'll hide from God. You'll put fig leaves on. And you'll become the product of your sin. Instead of embrace Him and enjoy His mercy and enjoy His love and let His goodness keep you transformed. You get it? Come on, this is a big deal. You have to see yourself continually righteous. In Christ, when are you ever unrighteous? When you fail to live by faith and receive His love. Then you'll live in a conscience that seems unrighteous, but through Christ, you're still made right in the sight of God. Isn't that amazing? He didn't just die for our sins. Chapter 2 says he died yet, but for the sins of the whole. People just don't realize it. But he already died. Oh, that's amazing. Now watch. If we confess our sin, he's faithful. He cleanses. If we say, now he clarifies this and strengthens verse 7 and 8. If we say we have not sinned. In other words, he says, if we say we haven't sinned and have no need of the blood, that's what makes us deceived. Who knows that I had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and I needed the blood of Jesus? Who knows that I've made a couple mistakes since I've been born again? Who knows that I'm not a condemned man? Who knows that I've stayed righteous that whole time and received Father's love through it all and it's what made me love Him even more because His mercy and all that good stuff about Him. Right? Oh, now watch. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word's not even in us. So if his word's in us, we all have to recognize our own ability to fail apart from him. We all have to recognize that we all need the blood of Jesus, that he died once for all, and that every man needs him, right? Now watch. My little children, these things I write to you. Why is he writing this to us? So we don't sin. So he's certainly not saying you're always gonna, three verses before. (laughs) The whole reason he's writing is so you don't sin. Or here's what he's saying. My little children, I write these things to you so that you do not sin. But don't dare think that you're not going to sin or you're whacked and deceived and truth's not even in you. But the reason I'm writing is so you don't, but you're always going (laughs) to. See how wretched we we can can make these one-liners in their interpretation? It's damaging. It's terrible, horrible. One-liners. You pull a one-liner out of the Bible and make it say what it sounds like it's saying without understanding it in its context is detrimental and damaging. A one-liner. To where the devil uses that one-liner to where you can't even preach righteousness and freed from sin. Because if you say you don't have sin, you're deceived and you make God a liar. That's a pretty heavy rap. So now the person that's preaching righteousness. The psalmist says, I haven't failed to preach righteousness in all the congregation. Righteousness preaching. All of a sudden people draw back from preaching righteousness. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. All of a sudden we can't even preach righteousness because if we say we have no sin, we're deceived and the truth's not in us. Now we're some kind of antichrist or something. And he's the son of righteousness with healing in his wings <laughs> and now we interpret the Bible to where we can't even preach the truth so the truth can not make us free so we do religious duty and we build buildings and pay homage to God instead of become like God oh I'm preaching so good <laughs> you guys are right <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> watch if we say we have not sin my little children these things I'll write to you so you do not sin watch this it doesn't say but when it says an if he doesn't even want you thinking sin see he just erased sin consciousness sin mentality sin identity in this whole chapter and we've reduced it in shallow understanding we've reduced it to saying we always have sin and haven't even understood the Spirit of God in writing. <gasps> you follow me? He didn't say when. He said an if anyone sins. Why? He doesn't even want you thinking sin. But if it happens, know this. It's the end of the world and you are damned and judged to eternal hell. Oh, it doesn't even say that. <laughs> wait a minute. No, i got to read here. Wait, wait, whoa. Wait. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate. He's with the Father. 
is Jesus Christ the righteous <laughs> do you see how powerful the word of God is <laughs> who is he oh he's not just Jesus Christ he's Jesus Christ the righteous and if I'm in him and he's in me and I'm the body of Christ I must be righteous too because if there's light in him and no darkness and he's in me there must be light in me they say we have no sin that's a self-righteous self-sufficient man that says he can work his way to God that he's a good man he doesn't need the blood of Jesus he's not guilty of sin he says I haven't sinned I don't need the blood to cleanse me because I haven't sinned that's all he's saying you'll see this if we confess our sins. See, here's the man that says, well, I have no sin. Paul says, that's deception. But if you confess, you have sinned. That's your born again experience. You say, I have sinned. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? Oh, watch. If we say we have not sinned, he's nailing it again because he wants no one in denial, no one in deception. He wants everybody humble and coming clean and repentant for the kingdom of God is at hand. If we say we have not sinned, have not sinned, do you hear what he's saying? If you say you have no need for the blood and you have not sinned, watch, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So he's preaching righteousness, forgiveness of sins, free from the conscience of sin. And he's saying, if you say you don't need this mercy and you don't need this new identity, then you're already deceived. Watch. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not... See, we don't read in context. We pull a statement out and when somebody's preaching truth, we don't realize how we've been deceived into pulling things out of context and actually combating truth and the real thing the Bible's saying. So when you Look, if you wake up in the morning and try not to sin, you'll be so sin conscious by noon it's ridiculous. If you wake up and enjoy your son and put on righteousness, you'll actually live holy till lunchtime. And you can't even hardly talk about the possibilities of God's grace in our life because we're so relate to sin that we think it's heresy when you talk about living free. You say, what are you saying? You're perfect? Not even saying that. I'm saying I've been made pure and it takes you a long way. I ain't looking to sin. I'm looking to manifest Him. You say, yeah, but brother, we all have sin. We say, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and make him a liar. And you pull that little one-liner out of John 1 and don't even know what it's really saying because in text it's not even saying what you're making it say. He says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. If you say you have no sin, you're deceived and make God a liar. What he's saying is if you have no need for the blood. What blood? Hey, I'm a good guy. I make apple pies for Millie. I do nice things. He's saying, but if you confess your sin, he's faithful just to cleanse you, forgive you of all unrighteousness and cleanse you. And he says, if you say you have not sinned, he clarifies it two verses later, what he was saying, we pull the one-liner out and bind ourselves to the identity of sin. Verse 1 of chapter 2 says, little children, I write these things to you so you do not sin. We're so busy pulling out the one-liner, we don't even know what it's saying. Yeah. You jump into the there, therefore, it's so dangerous, you don't even know what it's there for. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys all right? Yes. Come on. He says, I write these things to you, little children, so you do not sin. He didn't say, but when. He said, but if you do. You know what? There's so much accusation of heresy and blasphemy on this topic. I'm going to go with Jesus. I'm going to stick with Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to let my own conscience be free. I'm going to trust myself to Him. But I don't talk freely about it and openly and share my life because people would go on a witch hunt and they wouldn't be able to hear me anymore. They'd, well, he this and he that. You can live a whole lot freer than you believe. If you fix your eyes on righteousness, it'll produce its fruit to holiness and you ain't trying to be holy. 
you see the tree is good and the fruit's automatic. You don't have to try not to be angry. Try not to be jealous. Try not to be... That's works. You won't be able to do it. You become it in a place of relationship, yieldedness and intimacy. All that clay does is yield to the master creativity of the potter. You put yourself in his hand, pliable and useful and ready, and he shapes you and molds you and makes you and unveils you and goes, ta-da! And you can't take any credit for the way you live. All glory goes to God because you are what you are by the grace of God. But guess what you did do? You laid down your rights and you gave up the right to be angry, offended, judgmental, prideful, expectations. And you've just submitted yourself to him so you can become love. And oh man, nothing but love. He's t this rest of this chapter is he's talking about God being light and no darkness. He's in you. So we're going to walk in him and live in him. If we get born again, we have new life. We have fellowship with one another. We're walking in the light. Uh, we're confessing sin. Even along the way, if we stumble, verse 9. Verse 9 is not just a catch net verse because God knows you're going to sin all the time. That's how it's taught. No, verse 9 is how you get right with God. You face the fact that you have need of a Savior, that you've fallen short of the glory of God. You confess to God that you've sinned and missed the mark. You accept His blood and His sacrifice. You get born again and you have fellowship with one another and begin to walk in the light as He's in the light. Okay? That's what this is saying. And then it says, if you say you have not sinned, after saying if you say you have no sin, and he clarifies it, if you say you have not sinned. All he's saying there is if you say you have no need of salvation or no need for the blood. That's what he's saying. He proves that in the next verse because he said, I write these things so you may not sin. So he's not writing telling you you're always going to sin and if you say you're not, you're in denial. And then turning around saying, look, I'm writing this so you don't sin, but you always are gonna. That's, that's weird. No, he's not. He's actually calling you into righteousness and into the change of heart and life. He's saying, come out of the darkness into the light and walk in the light and have fellowship with one another. And his blood cleanses us of all sin. He's talking about the born again experience and entering into sanctification. Okay? That means a, a separation in, in, unto holiness, into God, with purpose. Now watch this. And, 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 and uh, I, I'd encourage you in the word sanctified, when you think of sanctified, don't just see it as set apart or called apart. I would always encourage you to attach on the back of that with purpose. You're not just set apart. Why would he just set you apart? That's waiting to go to heaven someday. That's just being a wheat and not tear. That's just being a fish that's a keeper and not a throwback. It's more than you just waiting for that day. So sanctified always carries the tone of with purpose in it. Does this make sense? Don't you see yourself as called out of darkness? Why? So you can walk in the light. Not just enjoy it, so you can walk in it, so you can live. There's always purpose attached to sanctification. Does that make sense? I don't know why I needed, it felt like I needed to amplify that. Okay, so he writes this so we don't sin, but if you do, not when you do, if you do, <laughs> in that song. But if you sin, it's not the end of the world, don't drag your lip in the dirt for three days and lose your identity. Why? Because you care and you didn't want to sin and you went, oops. You see what I mean? How many of you messed up and went, oops? I mean, seriously went, oops, man. See, that's the best thing you can do. <laughs> Sharon and I had a great talk on that one. And she said, so I shouldn't say, <laughs> didn't we have a good talk on that? And she cried. <laughs> it was so good. I said, no, don't say that. Because we're like, well, there I go again. There's a demeaning in that. It's like a downscaling. Like, there I go again. Prone to miss at me. Next thing you'll start thinking, it's a wonder you even consider. It's a wonder you even put up with me, Lord. Watch. If, if I'd, I'm not going to ask you to, don't raise your hands, but if I'd ask how many sincere Christians in this room that have purpose to grow in God have actually said, it's a wonder you put up with me, Lord, you'd be amazed how many hands would go shooting up if you were honest. And God never tolerates you. He loves you. He's not sitting there putting up with you. He's longing for you to see and understand and become. He's not keeping a checklist there. Jesse goes again. He blow it again. When is that boy going to get it right? 
He's not looking to Jesus. I don't even know why we have hope in him. I mean, we should have probably said once and for all, except for Jesse. (laughs) Come on, I'm being a little cynical and a little silly with it, but there's a point there because some people start to exclude themselves by demeaning themselves, and then they start putting God in a position of how they feel about themselves, and God doesn't feel that way. And all of a sudden we reflect our own lost identity on the way God must see us and we project it on Him towards us. That's a lie. There's so many lies that we've embraced. There's so many partial truths that we've pulled out of context. How can I be freed from sin if He didn't destroy the power of it? Romans 6 says again and again, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. It says, I live by the Spirit, not the flesh. Don't be afraid to see yourself by the Spirit. Romans 6 talks about the accomplished work of Christ, dead to sin, alive to God. Romans 7 talks about a man still living under the law, under the carnal nature, under flesh. He's damned, he's doomed. The things he wants to do, he can't. Romans 8 talks about not being condemned because you live by grace, by spirit, and not by flesh. And if you live by flesh, it's death. But if by the spirit, life and peace. It says we aren't those that live by the flesh, for we're in the spirit. Stop finding permission for a sin nature and a sin expression through Romans 7 without reading 6 and 8 as one big book. They're not chapters, it's one straight letter. You can read because the first verse of 7 says, or, or don't you know. And verse 8 says, therefore, chapter 8 verse 1 says, therefore. That means it's one big letter. It's one progressive writing. 